Thank you for joining us for this uh, Sunday evening, uh, probably afternoon, Bible study. Uh, this, again, is John chapter 3. Amazing uh, chapter that we find in John is filled with so much stuff. It's just a, a simple, well, seemingly simple, short discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. And, and although it is short, it is just packed in with tons of theological discussion and theological meaning and an understanding of God and understanding certainly of salvation. So I've had to break this into multiple parts. So we're only going to do verses 1 through 8, but you'll see by 1 through 8 that it's, if I did the whole thing, it's just it's very, it'd be very, very lengthy. But in this chapter is where we, we hear those famous words, you must be born again. Things that we have said time and time again, things that you've heard preachers say and evangelists say over the years, you must be born again, things that we've said to each other, that's the only way we must be born again. But Jesus reveals this new birth here to Nicodemus, and in turn, he's revealing the, the meaning and the significance of this new birth to us. So before we get into, uh, we'll start with verse 1, and before we get into that, let's bow our heads for a time of prayer, and then we'll jump right into this, because we'll need, to, need every bit of time that we can get with this chapter. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much, again, for your grace, Lord. I thank you for the, the, just the way that you take care of us and the way you love us in spite of our many imperfections. And, and Lord, I am I'm thankful, Father, that you work in our hearts and work in our lives. And I pray for the study over this chapter, Lord, and all the chapters in John, but for this chapter, O oh God, that we are able to soak in what it means, to, to soak in, Father, the... Uh, just the depth of it and that we can understand it clearly. And I pray that if anyone has questions that they, they don't hesitate to reach out to me, Father. And Lord, because I want those to be clear. And that's what my prayer is today, Lord, is these verses and this, the meaning in John chapter 3 that I present this in a clear way, Lord, that people can understand and be thankful for and be encouraged by. And I thank you for all that you do for us. In your holy and most precious name I pray. Amen. All right. So verse 1 in John chapter 3. Let's pull this up on the screen here. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. It's kind of the introduction here. Um, the Greek language in this, in this verse, it kind of indicates two things. And we can see that Nicodemus, although he was a Pharisee, he was, he was a, a normal man in need of a Savior. He was in need of this new birth that we have all experienced. And number two, that Nicodemus, although he was in the same state as all men, he was a, a sinner in need of a Savior, he was still different. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was uh, a Pharisee. He was in a, in a difficult position here in this circumstance. And uh, we saw in the last chapter, if you watch that one, that Jesus knows the heart of all men, and he knew exactly what Nicodemus was really looking for before Nicodemus even walked up there to meet him. So let's look at verse 2 now. It says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So what exactly was it that motivated Nicodemus to come to Jesus? It, you know, it could have been an opportunity to have a, a theological discussion with uh, another great teacher, but more than likely it was a spiritual hunger that he felt. Um, just the risk that he took, even coming to Jesus like that, was a great risk. And we know that the only way that we come to Jesus is by first Him drawing us to Himself. We see that in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Even in that verse, the language is, is, is rather clear. Um, it, it does use a description, the, the word of draw, it's a description of somebody dipping a bucket deep down in a well and then pulling it out. Uh, it's, it's, it's not as simple as we make it. I mean, we kind of sometimes, I believe, make God seem like He's up on a hill and He's calling your name and He's saying, Hey, hey, come up here. I, I want you. I want you to be my child. I want to give you a relationship with me. I want to, I want to make you born again. I want to change your life. That's kind of the way we present Jesus sometimes to people, but it's more than that. He, he gets a hold of the heart and He grabs a hold of it and he draws you to himself. It's a very powerful act, and this was most likely what was occurring. It was definitely what was occurring here with Nicodemus. And since we know the outcome of Nicodemus, uh, why by night, though? It, it, 
we know that Nicodemus kind of hid in the shadows for the most part until the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. It could have been that he feared the other Pharisees. Uh, he, maybe he didn't want to be seen in daylight with him. It could have been those things. Um, some people even have made a spiritual meaning in, in this. You can take that with a grain of salt. That, that This just represented the darkness that Nicodemus was, was living in by not knowing Jesus. It, but most likely it was because he was just kind of afraid of what the Pharisees were going to do. And I only base that off of how you don't really hear anything about him until he comes out in the crucifixion. Let's look at um, John chapter 12, verse 42. <clears throat> Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. I shared with this last week, but that was kind of the mindset of a lot of these people that believed in Jesus. They were afraid of the Pharisees, and they, they didn't really come out. Uh, but we see one little part about Nicodemus in John chapter 7, 50 and 51. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing. Does it? He, he, he doesn't just come out and, and outright defend Jesus, but he does try to, to safely bring up a question to them uh, because they are already falsely accusing him of all kinds of many things. But we do see him later on. This is the time when he really comes out as he joins Joseph of Arimathea in burying Jesus. And we see that in John 19, 38 through 39. I've already shared these with you, just catching back up. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, again, we see it there, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So we see them there. They're, they're finally coming out of the shadows, and they're doing something very um, bold right here in this moment. So they're, ma they're making up for a lot of lost time. But John, you know, he does use these mixture of terms all throughout the, his, his gospel here about light and darkness, and there, there probably is some spiritual meaning there. But uh, that's the thing about Bible study is you, you shouldn't always attach a spiritual meaning to something. You know, for instance, if they're talking about a time period or a time of day and, and, they, and John uses the reference of light, it doesn't always mean it's a spiritual reference to you being in the light. And when he uses night, it doesn't always mean that uh, it's a spiritual meaning for you being in darkness. It's, it's one of those nuances of Bible study that's really hard to follow sometimes. Now verse 3 in John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Really interesting stuff that's going on in this passage because he says, cannot see the kingdom of God. What in the world is he talking about when he says that to him? You see, the Bible does not give limitations on what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is everything that he reigns over, which is everything. It doesn't give limits. It doesn't give boundaries. You know, I think sometimes the the boundaries that we give are, are in, radically incorrect. Uh, we put limitations on God all the time. We tend to, as they say, put Him inside of a box. And that's just not the case. Um, but to see the kingdom of God. I mean, think about this in practical terms. To see the kingdom of God. Is He talking about a future event or is He talking about a present event? Well, again, the language here would indicate a present event, not so much that when we die we're going to see the kingdom of God. So what does that mean, see the kingdom of God? Unless you are born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's all part of that spiritual action that takes place during salvation. Again, we, when we are saved... It, it's, the, it's limited to this little box of our imagination. All that we see, and, and many have seen people in church, we'll see them sitting there, they get up, they might walk forward, they might bow down, they'll talk to a preacher or someone else, and they're saved. We think of that, that moment that their knees hit the floor and their head is raised up, we, we tend to think of that as salvation. But the whole act of salvation occurs much prior to that. That, that individual that did that, they saw the kingdom of God. They were able to see that God was real. They were able to see that, that He exists. 
they were able to, to see their sins that they had, and they were certainly able to see that they needed a Savior. That's all part of the kingdom of God. It happens all the time. You have people who attend church every Sunday. Nothing happens. They might be attending with a wife, or it might be a, a wife attending with a husband or, or a child. Child's, children are really good examples because they, they literally, some of them sit there since they were born. They might be in a car seat, and then they graduate up sitting on their mom and daddy's lap, and they're sitting next to mom and daddy, and then they just sit there, and they sit there every single Sunday, and they hear messages about the gospel. They are presented with opportunities to be saved. But yet one particular Sunday, I've seen this since I've been here, all of a sudden they see the kingdom of God. They are aware of who God really is. They are aware that these little hearts and these little minds, they're aware that they need a Savior, and then they are saved. Um, this is the action that he is trying to describe here, first of all, to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, here's the question, would he have really come up there and risked all that if his heart wasn't at least a little bit curious about what was going on? If he had not had a little glimpse of something that Jesus said that, was, um, that, that he was now perceiving as true as before he might have questioned? God does that. Uh, this, the, the Greek word that's used uh, prior to that, and when he says, unless one is born again, there's also a side translation to that. The word that is used has two meanings. One of those is again, born again, the phrase that we use all the time. We refer to ourselves as born again. I've seen some of these really neat shirts. The math, the math teachers would like it. It's got the word born in it. It's got parentheses and it's got the little square symbol, born again. Um, that's something that we're very familiar with. But the other translation to that is born from above. Both are equally true. When we're born again, we're born from above. It's an action that takes place entirely by God. Although we respond to that, although we repent, although we, we have faith, none of that would have occurred without prior action by God. Where we, we sum that up in this little tiny box called conviction. We'll say that I was convicted of my sins, but it's so much bigger than that. God was touching every part of our lives. He was touching our heart. He was touching our mind. He was touching our souls. He was not just convicting us, but He was convincing us and He was showing us the reality that He indeed exists and then we in turn respond to that. And I hope that's as clear as mud as some of my teachers have said before. But if you have questions about any of these things, please reach out to me and I'll do my best to uh, clear these things up. Uh, verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now, whether or not here, there's not much about going on in this verse, but whether or not he was being sarcastic or he was asking a sincere question that came off as sarcastic, it shows that he did not understand the concepts of being born again. It was confusing to him, and I understand that. You go up to a stranger that has never heard the gospel, that's never been associated with church whatsoever, and you ask them, have you been born again? They're going to go, huh? They're going to look at you strangely. They're going to think the very same things that he was talking about, about climbing up in your mother's womb and being born again. So let's look at his answer in verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There has been much debate over the centuries on what this verse has meant. Uh, what this verse means. A lot of people have used it in certain churches to say that the water represents water baptism, that you have to be baptized with water and you also have to be baptized with the Spirit to be saved. So they're teaching that you have to be baptized and repentant to, uh, to have salvation. But I have a problem with that because the way it's written. We don't so much see it here in this, but if you study the original Greek, it shows only one preposition before the nouns water and spirit. Um, it, it indicates that they're one event, not two separate events. It's not, it's not like I'm saying to you, um, I need you to go to the grocery store and then get me some toilet paper and then later go out and get me some milk. That's two separate events. So that would be two separate prepositions there in those words. But if I said, I need you to go out and get me some toilet paper and milk, that would be one event because you'd be getting them at the same time. Um, that here kind of leads us up into this. It's, it's not baptism, but I believe the language here indicates to us 
some of the stuff that we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Water in the language throughout the scripture is often used to describe a, a cleansing of life actions. It's not necessarily baptism. Obviously, that's with water, but water, you'll see that a lot throughout scriptures, and it represents a cleansing of the life, a cleansing of the spirit. One of those being in John 7. I'll go over these again when we get to chapter 7, but John 7, 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, see, of the water, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He, he associates right there in that time the cleansing of water and the Spirit as that's one event. The Spirit's not going to come and splash water on us, but the, the act of cleansing is what he is referring to with water. Also, the uh, Spirit is said to cleanse and regenerate in Titus 3.5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which, he, which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So he associates the cleansing of the Spirit with washing, which is done through water. And also in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, then I will sprinkle clean water on you. Again, that's not a, a literal thing. He's not going to spray water on us. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You can really see the strength of this cleansing that takes place in life in these particular verses. God does not just stand on a hill and call us to Himself. His calling affects our life. It affects the way that we think about Him. It affects the way that we see Him. It's a strong kind of calling. It's more than just conviction, but it's strong. But all of these verses have something in common. It associates water, the, the act of cleansing with water, with the act of the Holy Spirit cleansing our souls. I think those two things are the one and the same. Jesus is not telling Nicodemus that you have to be baptized with water and you have to be baptized with the Spirit in order to be saved. But he's associating those two things because of his familiarity with the Old Testament. Uh, verse 6 in John chapter 3, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In other words, he's, he's trying to get real simple with Nicodemus here. If I were to conceive, I can't conceive a child. If I were to conceive a child, I'd probably make a lot of money. But um, me and Lacey say we, we have another child. Well, that, is, that child is born of the flesh. It's, it's going to have our nature. It's going to have that sin nature. It's born of the flesh. But I can't make that child be born of the Spirit. I can't make myself be born of the Spirit. I can't. No one can No one can do anything or earn anything or live righteously enough. Otherwise, if that were the case... We would not need anything that occurred in the New Testament and we wouldn't need a Savior because if we could work it out on ourselves, God would just expect us to do it, but we can't. So I can't make a child be born of the Spirit. I can't make myself be born of the Spirit. I can't make anybody that's listening be born of the Spirit. That is an act of God. That is an action completely of the Holy Spirit. Um, that goes back to that uh, verse in Ezekiel that we saw. It was a prediction in Ezekiel uh, 36, 25 through 27 where he says these words, again, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. He changes everything about us. This act of being born of the Spirit is something that is entirely up to God and that's what Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus here to understand. So verse 7, these famous words, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Uh, I like this because it's very easily missed. If you study the Greek language, and it doesn't do this all the time, so it's not like it's a common thing throughout the New Testament, the word you is plural. If he was ta just talking to Nicodemus, it would have used a singular word and he would have referenced just Nicodemus. But he used the plural word for you. In other words, y'all must be born again. And I love that because he's even speaking to us today through the language of this verse. So verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, 
and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That is a... Uh, just as he was trying to clear things up with Nicodemus, I can only see in Nicodemus' mind the, the thought process of this verse. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not, where it, do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And that's the way that it works. Because, you know, frankly, there's no rhyme or reason on why people get saved when they get saved. We don't know this morning where the, the Spirit of God has been working. It's like the wind. We can kind of know what direction it's coming from because we can face it and feel it against our face and we can hear it and we can see the effects of it, but it, it's, it's invisible. It's this invisible pressure that's blowing from somewhere. It's the same way with the Spirit. God's Spirit just moves throughout the world and it touches lives and it changes lives and it changes hearts. Now there's a very real possibility that when Jesus said these words, He was referring to the prophecy of Ezekiel 37. Uh, because the word that Jesus used in this verse 8 here when He is talking about the Spirit, He uses the Greek word pneuma. And the other place that you see that, and it, by the way it means spirit, wind, and breath, pneuma, spirit, wind, and breath. And the other place that you see that is back in Ezekiel 37. So these are 14 verses, and I do want to read all these. Uh, so just bear with me and uh, read along or follow along. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again He said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel." Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Now, although that was lengthy there, um, go back and read it again slowly and slowly and slowly. But the Hebrew word here means the exact same thing, spirit, wind, and breath. And this prophecy regarding the Son of Man, Jesus, was the one who was going to come to bring uh, the Spirit and life back into Israel. In other words, these dry bones were going to wake up and they were going to become alive. When Jesus had used that Greek word to Nicodemus, it was probably something that had clicked in his mind of this prophecy in the Old Testament. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. It literally describes everyone who is born of the Spirit. And we've all been born of the Spirit. I've got one more quote here in just a second after this, but think about this. We have all been born of the Spirit. It's all been different circumstances. It's all been in different places. I was born again at Old Piney Grove, and God had been working on me my whole entire life up until that point. He breathed life into me. He awakened me. He opened my eyes. I was able to see the kingdom. I was able to desire to be in the kingdom of God. It wasn't an act of the preacher. It wasn't something miraculous that he was preaching. I cannot stand up here and preach good enough in order to save somebody. I cannot preach so well and so clear that somebody's eyes will be opened. That is an act of God. Up until that point, it's going to be foolishness. They're not going to understand it. They're not going to be able to grasp it. But up until that point, 
through the preached Word of God. The Spirit works. Eyes are opened. Hearts are enlightened. People are able to see the kingdom of God, desire it, and come to it. We've all been touched by this. Uh, This is out of Westcott uh, commentary, and this quote here. I don't always use quotes, but this is a good one. The believer shows by deed and word that an invisible influence has moved and inspired him. He is himself a continual sign of the action of the Spirit. We are continual signs of the action of the Spirit because why on earth would we want to do this? I mean, think about this, please. And I'm not discouraging anybody from coming to church, but think about this just for a moment. Today is a gorgeous day, beautiful day. Probably going to be 80 degrees out sunny today. We're probably going to get some storms later and pay for this warm weather, but it's beautiful. I could have slept in today. I could have, but I didn't. I got up, I got dressed, I came here. And any, if it was a normal Sunday, y'all would have done the same. It would have been a nice day when we would have showed up to church and we would have worshipped together and we would have sang together. Why? If this is not an act of God, if our new life is not an act of God, why have so many billions of people given up their entire lives to serve something that is false? Our very lives, our very actions, our very words, our very deeds are proof that this invisible spirit has touched our lives, has moved, has inspired us, has grown us, has changed us, and caused us to be born again. The very act that we meet together, the very fact that we listen, some people listen together this morning, is an act of God. God changes lives. This is why. I always encourage people this with, and I'll do this and then we'll we'll close with prayer. But I want to encourage you with this when it comes to evangelism. It's a thing that scares people because you think I'm not going to be able to go through the Scriptures well enough. If they ask me a question, I'm not going to be able to answer it. If uh, I, I might forget which verse it is, and I might just horribly paraphrase it. I, I'm going to get in there and be just this bumbling idiot. I, I get that. But I need us to understand what's going on here in John chapter 3. It is God who awakens the Spirit. It is God who causes that act of being born again to take place. It is all from God. People, us, we just respond to it. We repent, we have faith, we receive Him. It's not up to us. Billy Graham, as many people as he got to witness being converted to Christ, it was not because of him. It was not because of the words that he used, although he was a great preacher. It was not because of that. Our impact on this life is just meant for us to share our testimony with each other, share the gospel with each other. But it is God who does the work. So if you go into a home and you leave feeling that you've messed it up, that that you didn't say it well enough and, and maybe nothing happened, it is up to God. God is the one who awakens the heart. He is the one who causes that action of being born again. He is the one who moves. Like we saw in Jesus' words and in this invisible way, and we don't see where it's coming from. We don't see where it's going. We don't see the lives that are being touched. But all we need to do is just be faithful. Just be faithful to the Word. Be faithful to Him and, and be willing to speak our testimony and be willing to point people toward Jesus Christ. But He is the one who does it. I'm thankful that it's not up to me because I would fail. I'm thankful that it's not up to you because you would fail. But God cannot fail. God is effective on what He does. And when He gets a hold of a life, He gets a hold of a life. Could anybody deny that? Could you deny that if you were standing here right now? Could you have fought forever against that? The changing, loving grace power of God. God is amazing. And I'm thankful that God got a hold of my heart. I am thankful that He called me. I'm thankful that He drawed me. I'm thankful that I still feel His presence every day. I'm thankful for everything about God. And I pray that as we listen to these words going forward, and as we study these right now together, that that we are just in awe of God and what salvation really is. It's not just a simple little box thing that we've got going on up here at the church. But it's big. It's life-changing. God is life-changing. And He was changing Nicodemus' life right here in the beginning of chapter 3. So let's bow our heads together and we'll, uh, I'll have another devotion out Wednesday and uh, hopefully some news on what's going on here moving forward here at the, at the church. 
but I will see you then. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all things. I thank you for your blessed hope, your peace, Lord, your grace, your love, and I thank you, Lord, for the work that you do in our lives to be born again, to see the kingdom of God, to understand the kingdom of God, that, that it's not just some weak moment of you calling on the side of a hill, but it's an impactful action against a, a dead soul, against a dead heart, a heart that cannot know you without your intervention. And I thank you, Lord, that you do that for us, Father. I thank you, Lord, that there are billions of Christians all across this planet that are living testimonies of the life-changing power of the Spirit. And Father, just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and just help us to still remain close together even though that we're separated, Lord. And, let, and I pray everyone knows that they're loved today and not to be discouraged, but to be encouraged because of you, Lord. And thank you for all that you do for us in your blessed and holy name I pray. Amen.